No one has more state pride than New Mexicans. The vibrant culture, bold flavors, unique history and dramatic landscapes under our Zia sun are like no other. And the people of New Mexico are a rare breed. As diverse as we are, together we breathe life and soul into this high desert land, a land that promises adventure. I'm Michael Newman, and as your host, I'll be taking you with me as I seek out the best the land of enchantment has to offer. New Mexico makes it feels like home. Thanks for watching another episode of New Mexico True Television. I'm your host, Michael Newman. In this episode, we're exploring the Gila wilderness and the surrounding areas. From the dwellings of ancient cultures to the most contemporary in cuisine, we take in all this region has to offer. The Gila cliff dwellings sit in the heart of the Gila wilderness, an hour and a half north of Silver City, three hours northwest of Las Cruces. These cave dwellings were inhabited by the prehistoric Mogollon people over 700 years ago and are some of the most significant remnants we have in our state of ancient Pueblo people. A scenic winding mountain road leads you from Silver City into the depths of the Gila wilderness where you will find the trailhead leading to the cliff dwellings. Embarking on this mild hiking trail, you cross over the west fork of the Gila River and then cut through the Cliff Dweller Canyon. From the high mesas above to the river valley below, you're able to get a strong sense of the lush environment of plants and wildlife that helps sustain the Mogollon people in their days here. On the walk up, you get occasional glimpses of the cliff faces, but it's not until you climb further and round the corner that the caves are exposed. And it's magnificent. The way we enter the cave today is quite different from how the Mogollon would have done. Just imagine this entrance having ladders leading up to the rooftops of these structures versus an open doorway that you can walk through. Right away, you see how the Mogollon created a safe and desirable haven for themselves here. Perched high over the canyon, they have advantageous views of their own prey, as well as any potential threat to themselves. Being tucked into a cave, they have shelter and are securely protected. So it says here that there was actually a mural that sat right on this wall, but it also is a, just a test to showing the ancient architecture that the Mogollon people used here. There used to be full roofs and beams to protect within the cave. There's so much in here that it's left to the imagination. But I also had the opportunity so to speak with Superintendent about, about Hugh Hawthorne to fill me in on some of the history. Well, this, this place is uh, it's unique uh, in that uh, it's the only major uh, dwelling that the Park Service has that, that has, has to do with the Mogollon culture. The other thing that people don't realize about this is that it was probably only occupied for 20 to 40 years. Really? It's really probably only one or two generations worth of people. The people back in those days were doing a lot of moving around, but people, they see this such a, an imposing place that people think, well, people lived here for hundreds of years. Right. And, and that's not the case. I said, people used the caves before the building. There's probably a thousand years of use of the caves uh, before anything was built here. In today's day, we would call it prime real estate. Very much so. If you look, at, look out, you've got the great view. You've got the cave, which is relatively cool, a good water source down in the canyon. Plus, it's probably a place that's pretty easy to defend. It's remarkable to think how evolved people already were 700 years ago. I wonder how many of today's structures will stand the test of time the way these dwellings have. I guess only time will tell. When you're planning your visit to the Gila Cliff Dwellings, here's some things to keep in mind. The Cliff Dwellings are an hour and a half north of Silver City, three hours northwest of Las Cruces. The Cliff Dwellings are only accessible by a short, unpaved hike. The Cliff Dwellings are open daily except for New Year's Day and Christmas, but will be closed for safety if thunderstorms are in the area. Check your local forecast before you visit. Just eight miles north of Silver City and two hours from Las Cruces on New Mexico Highway 15 is the old mining town of Pinos Altos. And right smack on Main Street in the heart of this ghost town is the Buckhorn Saloon and Opera House. Known as one of the best old time watering holes west of the Mississippi, the Buckhorn is a popular spot among locals and travelers alike. From steak and seafood to pub favorites like burgers and salads, not to mention a weekly lineup of live music, this place knows how to draw people from near and far. The first Buckhorn Saloon in Pinos Altos opened in the final months of the Civil War. Today, the saloon is housed in a building with 18-inch adobe walls and a bar that was freighted in on wagons way back in the day. Hey. Hey, how's it going? Good, how are you doing? Good, I'm Michael. Welcome to the Buckhorn. Ah, oh, thank Ari. you. Ari, nice to meet you, man. 
Um, this place has some real character to it. Yes, it <laughs> does. It's got a lot of history as well. Okay, can you? Yeah, what built was back place? in the 1860s. 1860s. Um, yeah, it's a. This whole complex was one thing, and the only thing that's burned down, I think, was the opera house that okay. burned down and was rebuilt. But everything else is original. They had closed up some holes here in the floor, and there actually used to be tunnels secret tunnels that escape out of here for Apache raids and stuff like that. So, well, I think I need to get a drink, first of all. Have you been out gold panning today? <laughs> Not today, but I, you know, I, I brought all my, I wish I was, I mean, I Chasing back wild to Mustangs, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> is that a normal pastime? Is, there's never a dull moment around here. <laughs> we got a lot of great characters, especially uh, my friend down here at the end of the bar. Uh, Moose is his name, and he's got quite a few stories to share. Oh. Yeah. Some stories about this place? Yes. This, this, I mean, this is my first this, time here, but, so tell me about the history. If you walk around this place and look at all the pictures, mm -hmm. the pictures actually tell the history. One time there was supposedly 3,000 people here at least. Really? Not long into my conversation with Moose did I find out that he's not only a good storyteller, but he's also a poet. Everyone's busy with their fishing grout, selecting the lures to catch them a trout. Well, we have a bet and I want to win. Lord, please let me reel the big one in. Shot of whiskey just for a joke. Then it's down to the docks and into the boat. Well, later at night, back around the fire, we're all trying to figure out who's the biggest liar. Since nobody had a damn thing to show, but we'd all caught the big one and let it go. <laughs> Everybody's story was big as a well. Don't you just love a good fish and tail? <laughs> That's a good one. I like that one. <laughs> you never know who you're going to have the opportunity to meet when you saddle up to a bar in a town like Pinos Altos. A trip to town doesn't stop at the Buckhorn Saloon, though. Make your way across the street to check out the Pinos Altos Museum. Housed in an 1860s log cabin that once served as the first schoolhouse in Grant County, there are many historic relics and pieces of Americana you'll want to make sure and see. Operated by the Schaefer family whose own history is rooted in town, they are happy to show you around and share some of the backstories of the items in the museum. Pottery, local rocks and minerals, and other fun tchotchkes are relics of a different variety that can be found in the gift shop. Without a doubt, the town of Pinos Altos knows how to serve up a taste of the Old West. And now from our former Secretary of Tourism, Monique Jacobson, here is another New Mexico true treasure. Silver City and the Pinos Altos area have some of the greatest lodging options you can find anywhere in the state. Two of my favorites will really prove to you there is something for everyone. Right in downtown Silver City, you can find the Murray Hotel. This is a fully refurbished 1938 Art Deco Hotel. When I stayed there, I really appreciated how they were able to capture the essence of the past while making it very modern and extremely comfortable. It's also perfect because it is right in the heart of downtown Silver City. So you're able to walk to galleries and restaurants and then easily be right back at your home base. Now, if you're looking for something a bit more rustic, but extremely memorable and fun, perfect for family vacations, try the Bear Creek Motel and Cabins in Pinos Altos. These cabins take the vacation experience to another level. What I liked about this place was how charming it was. You really feel like you're out camping in the wilderness, but you have wonderful amenities like a fireplace and comfortable beds and a hot tub. Each cabin is unique and each is a delightful mountain retreat to lay your head. They are perfect for a romantic getaway or to bring your whole family for some fun outdoor adventures. These are just two examples of the many great hotels we have all around the state. Our lodges, hotels, and bed and breakfasts are definitely New Mexico true treasures. To learn more about this and other New Mexico true treasures, visit us at newmexico.org. In our first two seasons, we've taken you all over the land of enchantment to places we felt you would want to see and experience. Now it's your turn to share with us your New Mexico true treasures. All you have to do is get your smartphone and send an email or a 15 second video about why you think that place is a New Mexico true treasure. Who knows, we may even ask you to show us in person. Email your video to truetreasure at cliffdwellerdigital.com. Surprise and amaze us. We want to show our viewers your favorite spot and why you love New Mexico. Stay tuned to meet some of the best chefs in the state. Find steals and deals for your next New Mexico vacation at newmexico.org. And now from the pages of New Mexico Magazine.
Silver City is no longer one of our state's best kept secrets. While it has long been the gateway to one of New Mexico's most beautiful wilderness areas, it is only recently that Silver City's culinary scene has started drawing even more people to this small town. Yes indeed, Silver City has become a mecca for foodies, and I'm about to find out why. I head to Diane's Bakery, practically a Silver City institution. Classically trained in Europe and New York, Diane brought her culinary skills to Silver City, and it wasn't long before her bakery's success led to the opening of a full-scale restaurant across the street. Before that, in my career, I was doing, I was with the Ritz and Stouffer's in Hawaii, and then I uh, was with the El Dorado Hotel pastry chef up, up in Santa Fe. But then, I don't, I don't know, it's something about living in the big city, the quality of life. But I uh, arrived here overqualified and nobody would hire me, so hence I opened a bakery. And then I did well enough that I begged my son Bodhi, who was then living in Maui as a chef, to join me here and help me out. So the business has just kind of kept growing. Well, we're a family. Both of the boys bake, mm -hmm. so we can all pretty much do any job here. Right. Because as restaurant owners, we found that psh, you don't know, you have to be ready to do whatever comes at you. Oh, get out of here. That should be a sin. That is beautiful. Se magnifica. There's our chocolate cake. Oh. Bodhi walks me over to Diane's restaurant across the street, and I am equally impressed by what I'm seeing in this kitchen. It's not even noon, and I'm already invited to sit down at the family table. Food hospitality at its finest. Now I'm going to eat all this food, okay? <laughs> Just as her baking became the foundation of Diane's restaurant, so too did Diane become a pioneer of the Silver City food scene. After breaking ground in the culinary world of Silver City, Diane paved the way for new kids on the block, Trey Rosa. Owners King Crowder and Lila Adrian are transplants from the West Coast, and with their executive chef, Sean Bird, they bring a fresh taste to Silver City. Fusing together French, Italian, and Asian influences, another word for their new American cuisine would be eccentric. The team works together like a well-oiled machine to bring their delectable dishes to the masses. We're talking serious numbers here, folks. I didn't even realize this many people lived in Silver City. So it seems like there's a dynamic back there in the kitchen. What, what, what do you think makes a good team to be able to pump out all this food? Good leadership. Like our kitchen's based on a brigade. Everybody knows what they're supposed to do. And you can see it's almost like an orchestrated dance between it's you very, and... It's, it's, it's very much organized chaos. <laughs> and for most people, they would just see it as chaos, but it is, it is a dance. Yeah, Once things quieted down, I also had the chance to talk to King. Coming from Los Angeles and Lila's coming from New York City, we wanted uh, to bring the big city to the small town. There's things that we can't get, like the Korean barbecue, the hogi uh -huh. hogi. You can't get that unless you go into a bigger city. Right. And that's, you know, we want mm -hmm. it here. Silver City feeds their soul. You just want to stay. Mm -hmm. I think King is on to something. After all, how else can you explain such a collective amassing of exceptional chefs in this little pocket of New Mexico? And speaking of exceptional, my final stop today will be the Curious Kumquat, where Chef Rob Connolly has established himself as one of the most innovative and exciting chefs in town. Order up. This is what I pulled out of the woods yesterday. I love that you're just like, oh, when I was out and about yesterday, this is what I found. So, I mean, look at this huge oh, ball yeah. of sap. Mm -hmm. And because it's old and dry, the flavor's toned down. When, it, when the flavor's fresh, it's a, it's a little much. It's a little too piney or resiny. Right. But again, if you don't mind being a guinea pig, look at this. It's like a crystal or a gem. Yeah, no, for sure. So, and this comes right off the tree. Right off the tree. Let it soak in your mouth just a minute. Mm. At first, there's not much. Has a little spice to it. Mm -hmm. mm. Now it starts to come out. Mm -hmm. Piney, resiny. Um, oh, but it's good. developing and mm -hmm. it softens. Now it's almost like a candy, right? Mm -hmm. It's like a, a pine tree candy. Mm -hmm. So how do you control that flavor? Well, we can use sugar. Relying upon what he has locally foraged, harvested, and even acquired from his local 4-H club, Rob's menu is the epitome of local fare. Mm -hmm. It's just the pepper. Almost like a wasabi. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And oh, you, you can take this and fill it with things and treat it like a grape leaf, like a domus. Oh, wow. You it's can almost much. probably make a sushi out of that, some kind of esque. You, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow, that's a good idea. Yeah, I'm saying. <laughs> Rob's unique forging skills have garnered the attention of the James Beard Foundation, the equivalent of the academies of the culinary world. Primarily self-taught, Rob's sole culinary lessons have come from a local Apache man who has taught Rob forging techniques that have kept his people alive for centuries. What originally brought you to Silver City? Why did, why did the Curious Kumquat land in Silver City? The restaurateurs, the chefs, we're all here for a reason, because mm -hmm. we want to live in Silver City. Not because we want to open a restaurant in Silver right. City. Mm -hmm. 
Otherwise, our egos are, are so big, we would drive each other out of town, but none of us want to leave because we love it here. Right. And so we're going to all do our thing. Mm -hmm. And people are going to come and enjoy our food. And fortunately, we do different things. Right. If we were doing the same thing, it would be difficult. Right. It, it's an amazing food community. Yeah. What do you want to say that your investment to the food culture is in Silver City? There's a uniqueness that comes with my food mm -hmm. that you can't get anywhere else. Everything you eat, in the Curious Kumquat, I picked, I harvested, oftentimes I've killed, I've processed, I've plated, I've done the dishes, mm -hmm. I've taken out the trash. You get my voice in the food. And so that's what we're bringing to the table. I mean, it's, you're going to see in a second, very, very different than mm -hmm. any food you've ever had. Right. If I get it done. <laughs> <laughs> now that your stomach is grumbling, here's some tips for planning your Silver City dining experience. Each of these wonderful restaurants may be found on Silver City's Main Street, Bullard Street. While Diane's Bakery is the only spot open at 7 a.m. for the breakfast rush, all of the restaurants we feature do both lunch and dinner. These are popular restaurants in town, so consider making a reservation. And in the case of the Curious Kumquat, Rob is out there foraging his ingredients, so meals are while supplies last. For more great stories like this from New Mexico Magazine, visit newmexico.org. Coming up, we hit the trail that runs the span of the entire country. Need a reason to hit the road? Find upcoming events around the state at newmexico.org. Two hours northwest of Las Cruces on Highway 180, the small bustling town of Silver City serves as a gateway to the Gila wilderness. With some of the country's best wilderness at its back door, Silver City is a favorite destination among outdoor enthusiasts and adventurers, and it's especially popular among cyclists. Road cyclists and mountain bikers alike make the pilgrimage to this town every year, but for two very different experiences. Every spring, thousands of people descend upon Silver City for the famous national road bike race, the Tour of the Gila. And the rest of the year, mountain bikers flock to town so they may ride the Continental Divide Trail. The Continental Divide Trail, or CDT, is a United States National Scenic Trail that runs 3,100 miles all the way from Canada to Mexico. And Silver City is the first designated gateway community on the CDT Trail. I'm headed to Gila Hike and Bike to pick up a mountain bike so I can take on this trail myself. Like any great bike shop, they have everything you need to hit the trail. All kinds of bikes and gear, and even maps of the trails in the area. And one of the owners, Chris, hooks me up with a mountain bike for my height and build and familiarizes me with the fork and shifting. This is my first time riding a bike in Silver City. Great, the CDT is a great place to start okay. because um, we have a ton of good riding. So a lot of people come here to find empty roads, empty trails, and just miles of wilderness. I'm actually gonna be riding on the CDT later tonight after work. Okay, So cool. we can maybe so gonna meet, meet up? up? Are we gonna ride a little bit? Yeah. Sure enough, the CDT trail markers let me know I'm in the right place, and I'm off. I'm not on the trail long before Chris catches up with me. Hey, Michael. Hey. Glad you could make it. Man, this trail is awesome. Yeah, you're you having a good time? You're able to call this, you know, your, your spot after work, right? Yeah, this, it's amazing. Just come out here and it's a part of the CDT, which is really cool, but it hooks up to all the local trails and it's super fun. I let Chris lead the way since he clearly knows the trail better than I do. As we ride, I can't help but think of how far this trail extends behind and ahead of us. Just riding one stretch of the trail connects you to a whole network of travelers on the same path. It's pretty amazing. All right, water break, man. You got me winded. <laughs> yeah, grab some water. Yeah, it's just great being out here. You can hike it, you can bike it. For me, I love biking. Yeah, what, what's your favorite thing about biking? You're out here and it's just you riding down the trail, seeing all this beautiful country, feeling your, you know, your lungs, your heart beating. It's a journey. Yeah. And even the Continental Divide, like you're connecting countries. Yeah, because it's like the spine of the country. Yeah. Everything's tied together. The trail provides that, that avenue of connection. Yeah, the catalyst. Cool, man. Now this was so much fun. Riding the Divide. Just one more bucket list experience we have right here in New Mexico. The Gila Wilderness was designated the world's first wilderness area back in 1924. Many people venturing to the Gila look for a local outfitter to help introduce them to the many wonders of this wilderness. And for me, with this area being the homeland of the Apaches, the local Native American Guide Service Wolf Horse Outfitters looks to be the perfect way to go. 
Their base camp is just outside of Silver City in the Arenas Valley, just two hours northwest of Las Cruces off Highway 180. So Joe, what is, where does the wolf horse come from? Wolf horse is a spiritual name, and uh, it also depicts uh, my family's uh, tradition of being uh, native scouts, being able to travel around and, and see what's going on and bring information back to the tribe or to the group. Wolf Horse Guides Joe Science and Hank Ball take me out for a day trek through the Fort Barrett Elk Refuge. It's not a very big refuge. Uh, it's intended more to create a corridor for the animals to go from the flats up to the mountains. Because of that, we get everything. Uh, you know, everything, bears, cougars, uh, coyotes. Beyond the potential of spotting wildlife, Joe has extensive knowledge of Apache history and culture, as well as their foraging techniques and survival skills that he shares with people on his treks. We continue on to the Dragonfly site, a location known for its petroglyphs. For Apaches, it was about strategy. We didn't want anybody to know what we did, what we saw. But these, uh, these Pueblo people that passed through here, uh, they left quite a lot of sign. Uh, you know, we see a swirl down there. What we have here is this, this figure here that uh, people have believed it was a lizard. We have a man, and then we have a, a jackrabbit. What people don't sometimes uh, realize about prickly pear is that it's also medicinal, the pad. Besides eating it, uh, Apache is also used as, as, a, as a wound dressing. And you can you know, put the gel on to promote healing on your wounds, cuts. So everything technically had a use. We had a very working, intimate knowledge of all the plants. You know, Everything we did was to promote the, the, the health of the land how we used plants, how we moved around. Uh, we weren't nomadic. Uh, we had very specific places we migrated to, and a lot of it was because of the harvesting of plants. Uh, people don't understand that Apaches were probably 60 to 70 percent uh, plant eaters. Mm -hmm. Undeniably, the Apaches were a resourceful people, and they knew this land better than anyone. Traditionally, Apaches in our creation story, we have a flood story. And to us, that line which exists throughout this country, even all the way down to Deming and to the Western Mountains, uh, it, it indicates the height of the flood. And when, uh, when this vision came to, to the people that this flood was coming, uh, Apaches were instructed to go higher up into the mountains. And they, we believe that that's why we became mountain people, uh, because we got up high enough to get out of the flood. Joe has taught me so much about the Apaches. I can't believe all that I've learned in just one day. This trek is the epitome of a great traveling experience. A trip where I'm exposed to a unique history and culture, my perspective is broadened, and I leave with a new appreciation for the land and the people that call it home. When you're ready to saddle up and head into the Gila wilderness, here's some hints. Wolf Horse Outfitters is based in Arenas Valley, just three miles east of Silver City and less than two hours northwest of Las Cruces. For day rides, you have the option of scheduling an hourly ride, half day, or full day. But better yet, consider a multi-day pack trip, customized to your riding abilities and interests. All rides will focus on the surrounding environment and will be a minimum impact to the wilderness. Leave no trace. No wonder so many people flock to this part of our state. From the towns filled with history to the magnificent Gila wilderness, this is something everyone should experience for themselves. As always, thank you so much for watching. I'm your host, Michael Newman. We'll see you next week right here for another adventure of New Mexico True Television.